So we have a couple more things to cover. Um, a couple points here about the influence of the precipitation and heat treatment of alloys. Um, and then we'll get into some of the next chapter materials. Um, there's a lot that goes into each and every one of these particular lessons. Um, but there's a lot of, of background as well. And so we'll take all of the principles that we've covered for 9, 10, and 11 and, and pull in some examples of what's happening at those different stages and kind of uh, break those down so that you can see what's actually happening with them. Um, but starting with a non-equilibrium solid solution, you have at uh, 204C at the higher temperature, the maxima on the tensile strength increases um, and the increasing temperature accelerates the process. So it takes less time in order for this to happen. So manually precipitates, um, many small precipitates uh, in the material um, create what we refer to as aged. Um, fewer large precipitates is what's called over-aged, meaning that there's a, a difference in the concentration uh, and size of these precipitates, and that changes also the minima on the, um, on the ductility curves such that you get some differences in the way that these behave. So the 204 and 149 uh, curves show you two very different minima in terms of uh, ductility. So across a couple different samples, these have a significantly lowered instance of, uh, these have a significantly lowered instance of ductility for these samples. So these ferrous alloys, both steel and cast irons, um, the non-ferrous alloys, uh, the copper, aluminum, titanium, magnesium, all of these, the refractory alloys, noble metals, um, all of those are the non-ferrous alloys, so non-iron-based um, materials. These fabrication techniques, specifically forming casting and some of these others, these are what we want you guys to focus on primarily. Uh, we're going to look at some examples of those in practice and the hardenability of metals, uh, meaning the measurement and ability of a steel to be heat treated. So it's it's how much or to what degree can something be heat treated. Then there's an increase with the alloy content. So we talked about that quite a bit. Um, and the precipitation hardening and the hardening and strengthening due to the formation of precipitates and particles, uh, as well as the aluminum and magnesium alloy uh, that are precipitation hardenable um, rather than something like uh, simply normal heat treatment. Um, the precipitation hardening uh, is much more suitable for the crystalline structure of those types of alloys. So we'll look at a couple examples of those, um, but it'll help to see how they can be used for some specific examples. People who cook steaks at home will tell you the only way to get a good sear is with a cast iron pan. But in the last couple decades, cast iron has reclaimed its throne as the king of all cookware in America. One of the fun parts about cast iron is you can find an old rusty pan and nurse it back to health, or buy a new one made by hand by a boutique metal worker. However, the most popular cast iron pans are made by Lodge Cast Iron, where the family owned business has been doing it since the 1800s. They're available everywhere, they're ultra affordable, and they do everything you'd want a pan to do. So today, I'm in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee at the Lodge Factory to see how their process has evolved over time and how they create one of the most consistent and widely loved products in American history. Welcome to Dan Does. The three components of a Lodge cast iron pan are pig iron for heat retention, steel for malleability, and finally scraps and reject pans from all around the rest of the factory. The iron comes in and flows out to the pan. These are cold. That's pretty loud. Part of the fun. Part of the fun. 
This is the rejects. At any point, if someone doesn't like what they're working on or there's extra scrap, they send through here. If a pan doesn't pour right, it's immediately rejected okay. and thrown in. And then if one of our employees sees a defect on a pan anywhere and doesn't like the look or feel of it, yeah. they'll throw it back in for remelt so that we don't waste anything. Oh, it's happening. This guy must be so good at that claw game. Nah, everyone makes that joke. So that hopper will move it into the furnaces to be melted. So here, this is what's been filled with all our raw material. It gets shaken through that chute and dropped into this container that'll move it. So that's how we get everything into the furnace itself. From here, the mix of metals is brought up to 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit, and then it is slagged or has its impurities removed for the first of two times. And then all the impurities in the iron, that, the rust that you saw, the sand and everything, is right. floated to the top now. So the robot is actually going in there and clamping it and bringing it out and pulling it out so it doesn't go in the iron. From here, the molten metal is poured into what is essentially a giant ladle, which will be used to transport it to the next stage of the process. All the sparks that you see flying, we call yellow jackets. Right. They sting when they hit you. So hence the protective clothing. I would have thought they did more clothing. than sting. Yeah, they do. But some of the old timers used to say, if you licked your fingers, you could run your finger through the molten metal. Now the ladle moves from the melting to the molding section of the factory, where it is slagged again before it gets poured into molds made of sand. We've seen the melting, and now we're going to pour into our molds. And our molds have to be able to hold 2,500 degree molten iron. Right. So you just can't use anything. So we actually use sand. Sand just like you would see on a beach somewhere. But you know, sand melts above 3,000 degrees, 3,100 to make glass. Well, since we're pouring 2,500 degrees, right. and we don't hurt the sand, and we continually can reuse it over and over again. Part of the thing is you guys move through a, a lot of sand that's constantly being molded and then remolded, right? Right, we're constantly remolding that sand. We add a certain amount of new sand to replenish the amount that we lose on the castings when we clean them. Right. I feel like people wouldn't know that a huge component of the cast iron game is sand. Yeah, just like they play at the beach. We have a finer sand than traditional foundries run. Our sand is made specifically for our castings. Let's get up there and check the sand Sure, let's go. So we've mixed all the sand up where we've added the clay and the water, and we brought it and mixed it up, and now it's coming, and these, this belt then distributes it to our two diesels. So here's some sand. So the sand is, is really, it's soft and fluffy. You can hold it. But when you squeeze it, it Oh my god, sand. yeah, like a really good snowball. So the sand comes in yellow, just like you would see, but after we poured iron in it and the clay levels burned up and things like that, it right. turns black. So the way this works is these come down to stop the sand from rolling through and send it down to one of the lines. It feeds whichever line's calling for sand at that time. And if it doesn't go through either, it just gets sent back and back around? Both systems are full, the belt will stop and we won't send any sand out. The sand now falls down one of two chutes before being formed into a mold and then filled with the molten metal from before. Okay, so we've seen the sand come down. So this yeah. fancy machine is, is creating our sand molds. Yes. So how does this work? We got a tool that's on this side of the machine called the ram. We got a tool that's on this side of the machine called the swing. They face each other inside that chamber. We blow the sand and squeeze it. We pull that pattern out of the way. It's on a swing, so it swings out of the way. There's an impression on that side of the mold. He pushes it all the way out, retracts the ram. Now that impression's on that side of the mold. We make another mold. The front of this mold now matches up to the back of the other mold, and then we just continually do that. That's one half, they match up. You can see the gating going across, and how all that, anything that's a void or a shape in here is the void in the mold, and that's where the iron fills it up. So one mold does not get you a pan. You need the mold and the previous mold. Yes. Or the mold and the next mold. Yes. On this gotcha. type of molding unit, yes. So we're running the 8SK, which has a logo on it right now, okay. which is our 10 and a quarter, which has the deer logo on it. Is this hot? No, but it's hard. Remember how soft that sand was I showed you? Go ahead and push your finger in there. It's very, very dense. That's what allows Lodge Manufacturing to make our castings the same every day. Now it's time for the sand molds to be filled with the molten metal mixture that we saw earlier. 
So it's like no pan, pan. That's right. And about 10 molds down from there, if we wanted to, we could knock the sand out and that casting would be solid. Do you love this part? <laughs> there isn't a part of the foundry I don't love. I don't like inventory. How's that? I don't like don't inventory. Like inventory. No. But if you think about what we're doing here, yeah. we're taking these raw materials that were nothing when they came into the yeah. In a matter of a couple hours, we're making a brand new product right. that someone is going to take out of the box and cook a meal in for their family that night. So this is where they dump, right here. They dump off the line here, and they go in this shaker pan. They break up a little bit in there, and they go into this big Gideon drum. So right now, all these castings now are coming up the line, and our folks up here know what castings need to go through which production line. Okay. So they're up here separating the gating from the castings, putting the proper castings on the cleaning machines, and the other ones are sending down to the other cleaning machines. At Lodge, this is one of our more difficult roles right here. It's not so much the physical part of it, but it's the heat. After workers pick through and place pans on their respective cleaning lines, any castings, scraps, or pans that haven't made the cut for any reason are sent back through the factory to the original scrap heap where they will be melted and then used in the recipe for future products. These are motors that are spinning impellers and we're shooting this shot. Oh, they're, it's like a pellet gun. Yeah, so these are the dirty castings that were going in to the cleaning machine. And you can see there's still quite a bit of sand on them. This is how they come out. Still hot? Yeah, they're warm. You know what they say about cast iron, right? It holds the heat. It does for, for a long time. And that's from the pelleting? Yeah, that is from the blasting that we just did. Any questions? How did you become the Capital One Bank guy? I've always been passionate about no fees or minimums on checking accounts. Weren't you in the Hall of Fame? And didn't you live in space? What's in your wallet? Brisket is back at Chipotle. It's a whole new kind of brisket, done the Chipotle way. The pans are now washed in an aggressive bath of soap, water, and steel beads before being sent off to the seasoning part of the operation. These feel pretty heavy, don't they? Yeah. They don't damage it? No, it actually does a little burnishing. When you grind on the edge, you create just a little bit of a sharp edge. Just seasoning process now. So these pans are done, right? Like you could sell this pan and it would just be unseasoned. Correct. And before our seasoning process, that's how we sold them, but we used to dip them in a wax. Okay. And then the consumer had to go home, take the wax off, coat it in oil, right. put it through their oven and season it themselves. So now we've applied the oil, just a soybean oil, and you can see that they're all sprayed evenly. So from here, they're getting heat up? Yeah, we're gonna go up in this oven, run them in here about, yeah, about 15 minutes uh, at a really high temperature. So this is what I was talking about before, about our spot seasoning, that drip. And if you look close, you can see the drips hanging right there. Yeah, go on up. Oh, no way. See the drips? Yeah. This is right here. Just uh, look, look over your, your empire. What does it feel like to look at everything going on out here, though? You take a look at all these passings that are coming down the line. You know, we're not making them for cars. You know, we're not making parts for who knows what. Right. And we're making cookware for people to use. That's what that's what drives a lot of us here. When you first come to work, you don't realize that. But after you've been here a little while and you understand what we feel every time we make a casting, and you think about the next person who's gonna touch this is someone in, in their yeah. family or some individual is gonna take this and make make something with it. Is that enough poetry? Oh, I'm not done yet. So this is another pile of rejects here. So these are ones that our takeoff line people inspect. They're the final inspection before we put them in a box. Okay. So this casting is scrap. We will not sell this as a first quality casting. I mean, I have no idea, but it seems like at least 10 or 15% don't You're close. make it. It's a little less, and that's overall. Right. This job, this eight skillet, we're probably, I don't know, three to five. Makes but then we have some other ones that are a lot higher, but we average out at less than 10. You want to you wanna label something? I'll label something. Oh, man, you ain't trained. 
I'm making his life more difficult no, you're right not. now. No, you're not. Can I put one more on here? Nope. nope. Three? Three to a side. <laughs> it's tough. I, mean, I can I'm dance. Amazed. I'm amazed every single day. Now, he has a little advantage in you because he's looking ahead. So he's, he's inspecting the backside as they're coming down the line. If you watch him, he's looking. I don't have his wherewithal yet. No. I think I'm losing my cool here already. Okay, push him down. I feel like you have to have nine arms. Should we bring him on board? Yeah. We're gonna bring him on board. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, Larry. Each aspect of the job is actually like its own level of art. loaded up the pallets and then now we're gonna send them to the monster distribution center yeah we have a distribution center just off-site here where we do direct to consumer we pick orders specifically for customers or sometimes they're cool pallets you know and they just load it's important to note about this operation the the key steps that they're taking so we've seen them using scraps and doing the recycling. This is a very great example of a very efficient modern casting operation. This is what they are doing day in and day out. Um, so they are taking the slag out. They are pouring these into the actual molds. There's another stage of slag removal. They make their With the mold. they make their sand molds with both sides. So both sides of whatever the impression is. And then they fill it with, you can see it barely at this stage. They fill from the top of the mold and they get a real nice smooth casting for the most part with some rejects and then they separate out some of the leftover materials so each of these goes down to a different line the scrap gets fed back around to the scrap pile and this is the way that a modern uh, very efficient casting operation looks so there's some other examples that i wanted to go through so i'll bring those up so this will help give you a much better idea about a larger scale forging operation and what the modern approach to this looks like so that you can get the concepts kind of nailed down for what happens with these. All right, before we get going, boys, put on the safety glasses. Oh, Kel's having a hard time here. All right, ready to point F. Ready to roll. Can I explain a little bit about the Yeah. Hi, so let's uh, talk about the wheel manufacturing process. The uh, first step in the process is to uh, bring in the aluminum from the mill, which you see behind this here. And then we cut it up to uh, the individual pieces, which you see on the pallet here. The size of the piece depends upon the weight of the underlying wheel. Right. The bigger the wheel, the bigger the piece of billet. Makes sense. So this is all 66 to 1 uh, aluminum. All comes from various sources around the world, and we store it right here in Oxford. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Awesome. You mind if we go get some footage of him cutting that? Absolutely. Perfect. Let's yeah. do that. So uh, now we're going into the forging area. So uh, the various cut pieces of aluminum that we saw just a moment ago are going to come on in here and they're going to get heated up to about 900 degrees Fahrenheit and then they're going to get forged in a rotary forging press. So let's head on in here and we'll see the forging process. That sounds awesome. So in here we see the forging process, which is actually a rotary forging process. 
go right behind this ear. We keep taking a piece out. Now we're seeing them put a piece into the forging press right here. So they're scooting it down the conveyor and putting it into the press. Oh, right now. Yeah, coming right down the end there. So it's a pretty heavy piece. So there it goes into the forging press. Yeah, now we're going to see the press come down. And the top and the bottom die are spinning, hence the rotary forging process. So you can see the press coming down, it's going to squeeze it between the top and the bottom die. See it right there. Okay, so they're just about done with the forging process, so the door is going to open. Just here momentarily. And then the part's going to get knocked up out of the bottom die. I'm going to grab it with uh, with this manipulator and move it from the press into this desk. There we go. Good picture of it. So it's pretty hot, about uh, about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. Very hot. So the ejector is going to push the part up out of the bottom die. Well, and you're going to grab it with the manipulator. You're going to bring it back over here and set it in this basket for the next operation. Process, we're checking the flatness of the part and the potential accuracy of the part as well. Some people just know they could save hundreds on car insurance by checking Allstate first. It's going to get nasty later. Like so, uh, from here it's going to go on to the to the next operation. It depends on the type of wheel it is. If it's a center for a multi-piece wheel, then it's just going to get heat treated and it gets shipped to our customer. In the case, this case here. This is actually a military wheel, oh. so this is going to get uh, spun on a spinning machine, which we'll see next, and eventually get heat treated in lane turn. So we'll see that operation next. Oh. So what we're going to take a look at next is we're going to take a look at the spinning process. So when it's done being forged, rotary forged, the next step is for the part to be uh, spun on a spinning machine. So we're going to take a look at that next. Hi, what we've got going on here is a different spinning machine. Uh, this machine loads the part from the robot now off the shelf that puts it into the machine, then it runs and the robot unloads it. So again, it's a spinning process. It makes the forged part and uh, turns it over a tool into the finished, finished machine part, ready to be received. So, we'll start here in just a moment.
what we have now is the, is the part that's done from the spinning process. As you can see here, so it's the rough shape of a wheel, ready to be heat treated, aged, and then machined into the final product. This particular wheel is a front drag race wheel for oh. uh, either a funny car or a drag race. Oh, that's really cool. So racing. Yep. Nice. Yep. Gotcha. What we've got going on here is the parts that have now been spun. Like what we just saw. Just like what we saw a moment ago, okay. and they've been heat treated and changed, so they're uh, properly hard for machining. And now what we do is we take the wheel, we're going to see behind us in its, in its spun form, and we put them into the laser machine, the finished laser. Okay. So, for example, with any uh, motorcycle wheel right here, so it's been fully laid turned, ready to be milled. And the operator here put in the uh, part into the machine, and he's trying to, uh, he's trying to run the cycle here and uh, finish it up to each leg for me. So we start the process here. And then uh, when it's done, we'll see the part come out of the lane machine. It's going to look just about like the machine. That's pretty cool. So how long did that process take? Uh, this process probably has a cycle time of about uh, oh, seven or eight minutes. Oh, so that's pretty fast. Yeah. Here, here we see them kind of wiping down the, wiping down the part, ready to be inspected. We'll show the inspection process in a few minutes here, where we do the final inspection on the wheel to make sure that it's dimensionally correct. So what we see on this pallet here is finished late turn product. It's ready to be sent to the customer. It's been dimensionally checked. The hardness has been checked. Everything is good to go to the customer. So what they get is a part that's finished, slave turned, ready to be milled. The milling would include their style, whether it be hand rolls or spoke, and also, in this case, a motorcycle wheel attaching the hub. But for a car wheel, it's going to have the, the bolt circle uh, drilled into it, milled into it, for the fitment pattern for the vehicle. Um, but it's, uh, it's ready to go, um, uh, ready for their design and finished build. What we have going on here is we're laser scanning the part to determine its, its accuracy dimensionally to the drawing. So once the part's finished laser turn, we bring it over here like you can see, and then we use a laser scanner to scan the whole surface of the wheel, which takes about a minute or so. And at that point, you have the whole part uh, digitally representing the computer. And then you overlay it against the against the drawing of the part oh, okay, yeah. to determine exactly that it's correct physically, and it's and it's thousands of points that the laser done. This is opposed to the way things were done uh, in, in, in previous years, which was to take things like height gauges and caliper sure. to physically measure the part, uh, which takes quite a long time and is not nearly as accurate as the laser, which takes thousands of points of a, a second. And uh, it's a lot more it's accurate, a, a graphical representation of it. So at this point, the product ready to be shipped to the customer with 100% certainty that it's dimensionally correct. Wow, that's pretty cool. So we pretty So these forging operations are important. There's an awful lot of steps in them, uh, especially starting with the uh, initial hot stamp. So starting from the billet, um, I'm not gonna go through uh, all of their advertisements again because uh, reasons, but the key is to understand what's happening there. And there's a big difference in terms of strength. So I'll grab an example of what that looks like because it's important to understand how these graphs and concepts translate into real usable examples of materials and what that behavior looks like in the end use application. 
original manufacturing methods and select materials leads to the pinnacle of forged wheels. Combining materials and technology to create the ultimate in aluminum wheels. Let's see how these forged wheels are made. The manufacture of forged wheels begins with the selection of the best possible material. Based on the aluminum 6061 alloy, these billets are comprised of our original premium blend aluminum alloy, developed with an emphasis on strength. Prior to forging, the billets are first heated to over 500 degrees Celsius to enable the material to be shaped into various innovative designs. Using the heated billet material, we finally move on to the modeling forging process. TE37 Saga wheels are shaped using mold form forging dies in three stages. In the first forging, the billet material is made into a pancake shape with a diameter close to that of the finished wheel. The forging press applies several thousand tons of pressure, approximately five tons per square centimeter. To get started in data analytics, you don't need previous experience or a degree. The Google Data Analytics Certificate. From the second forging, a step-by-step -step mold forging from the pancake shape is performed. To achieve lightweight spokes, the cross-sectional shape is formed by forging from the backside. As you can see from the 3D model, the center of the spokes is hollowed out. Next is the third and final stage of shape forging. Together with the wheel design's overall shape, the hollowed out portions formed in the second forging are transformed into U-shaped cross-sections, characteristic of thin-walled forging. Lightweight is the aim of this final stage, and a seamless grain flow is achieved through this unique die forging method to obtain the desired design, strength, and rigidity. This die forging method employs Ray's Engineering's proprietary shuttle type die forging system. Ray's Engineering developed a shuttle forging press machine that slides the forging die sets from three directions to perform the first, second, and third forgings. This forging press can apply a forging pressure of up to 10,000 tons. The key to maximizing forging performance is the forging die's design. In the three-stage forging used to transform the billet material into a wheel shape, the wheel's design side and reverse side are integrally shaped by three-dimensional shaping using the die forging method to form high-strength, high-rigidity, U-shaped cross-sections for the spokes. Ray's Engineering's designers combine expertise, creativity, and a thorough understanding of the materials and manufacturing equipment with leading-edge forging technology. This RM forging machine is also our original technology. In addition to forming the final detailed shape, it uses proprietary dies to simultaneously form the outer rim and the flaring of the inner rim. Similar to the mold form forging process, the material is heated and the heated wheel is rotated as the roller flares the inner rim. When metal is heated and compressed, such as in forging, fiber-like lines called grain flow appear. No machining is used to form race wheels. Only the mold form forging made possible with our unique die forging method, guided by the experience and knowledge of our design engineers. As a result, the grain flow lines fan out from the center of the wheel in a distinctive pattern, like the fibers of bamboo. This spinning process forms the inner rim's final shape. Inner rim molding from 5J to 13J is possible with a flexible mold by taking advantage of the elongated characteristic of the aluminum alloy that is uniquely compounded.
Following forging and rim forming, the aluminum alloy is heat treated in order to maximize its unique properties. The heat treatment process consists of quenching and tempering. This heat treatment process is precision controlled to maximize the aluminum alloy's three key mechanical properties of tensile strength, proof stress, and elongation. As a result, even with a lightweight, thin-walled rim, good steering stability and suspension stiffness are maintained during cornering. The material of the Ford's wheel which has undergone heat treatment, undergoes mounting processing in advance of the tire inflation and vehicle attachment processes. In two processes, both the outside and inside of the wheel are machined to achieve a precise balance within one one thousandth of a millimeter, an essential factor. PCD drilling is another process that requires high precision, since the balance of the wheel's mounting points on the vehicle is a critical factor. The air valve hole is also drilled parallel to the well angle of the wheel. Burrs remaining from machining on the spoke edges can reduce corrosion resistance after painting. To prevent this, Ray's Engineering developed a method using a special tool that rounds the spoke edges on the rear side of the wheel during the machining process. This edge trimming ensures better adhesion of the coating film that's formed in the painting process, improving corrosion resistance for the wheels, which are subjected to corrosive conditions due to their proximity to the road surface. This edge trimming method is a patented Ray's engineering technology. Knurling is a process that improves wheel performance on race cars and other high horsepower vehicles. It helps prevent slipping between the tire and the wheel that might occur due to repeated, sudden acceleration and deceleration. Eddy current testing is used to inspect for hairline cracks invisible to the naked eye. In particular, the camber force that is repeatedly exerted on the inner rim edges during driving can cause cracks to appear in the rim if there are any internal defects, leading to a loss of driving performance that could potentially pose a serious risk. Considering possible worst-case scenarios, each wheel is methodically inspected for defects. At Mint Mobile, we like to do the opposite of what big wireless does. They charge you a lot, we charge you a little. Wheel strength, rigidity, and balance are essential to ensure safe, comfortable driving. All three factors are numerically verified right from the design stage. Here as well, our designers, knowledge and experience are a solid foundation for design plans to create ideal wheels that are strong, lightweight and beautiful. Proven designs are the basis for Ray's Engineering's wheel manufacturing. Radial load fatigue tests evaluate disc fatigue durability. The Japanese government's JWL standard requires 100,000 rotations, but Ray's Engineering has set its own plus R standard of 200,000 rotations. This ensures sufficient performance to withstand the lateral g-force during cornering in severe driving conditions. Simulations at the design stage enable predictive design to guarantee the required lower limit. Now let's look at the appearance-related processes. In the final stage of manufacture, the wheel surfaces are carefully polished by hand to remove the lubricant applied during mold form forging, as well as galling marks from hot forging so as to ensure a beautiful finish for subsequent decorative painting. This work relies on the skill of Ray's Engineering's dedicated staff. Shot blasting has two purposes. First is to increase strength. While the forging, heat treatment, and machining processes already ensure ample strength, shot blasting is performed using stainless steel beads to make the wheels even stronger. Second is to level the forged surfaces. Painting the forged surfaces as is would not achieve a desired beautiful appearance. The wheel surfaces are degreased prior to the powder coating undercoat. There are three processes, alkaline etching, acid pickling, and chemical conversion coating. 
A chemical conversion coating is formed on all wheel surfaces to ensure good adhesion of the paint and enhance corrosion resistance. The rotary degreasing system seen here uses a dipping method patented by Ray's Engineering that ensures a uniform chemical conversion coating. The powder coating undercoat is then applied to the degreased wheel. The advantage of this powder coating is that its thickness enhances anti-corrosion performance. It also serves to level any unevenness of the forged surfaces. After the undercoating, a variety of solvent coatings can be applied, depending on the desired specifications for each wheel. According to the design specifications, diamond cutting is performed after painting for a lustrous shine. Our original aluminum alloy material is characterized by its lustrous shine. Designs that bring out that luster are achieved using diamond chips. This is essential for deep rim specification wheels that have a deep outer rim. To maintain the anti-corrosion performance of the diamond cut surfaces, diamond cut wheels are treated using the rotary degreasing system seen earlier. This entails the same three processes, alkaline etching, acid pickling, and chemical conversion coating. Again, the Ray's engineering patented dipping method ensures a uniform chemical conversion coating. A clear coat needs to be applied to the diamond cut wheels as soon as possible after degreasing. So, after air blow drying, the wheels are sent to the painting booth area. Ray's Engineering's factory automation line system prioritizes anti-corrosion performance. After degreasing, the wheels are transferred by robot or PLC controlled lines to the solvent coating booth area. The clear coat is applied in two stages, first primer, then the clear coat. A variety of transparent and colored clear coats are available to meet specific needs. Right now, get $50 off per axle on a standard brake service at Firestone Complete Auto Care. The most prominent feature of AMT, Ray's advanced machining technology, is the ability to engrave markings on wheels after a coating has been applied. With AMT, the grooves cut by the machining tool are left as is. This enables letters and other delicate markings to be engraved as continuous lines. No matter how difficult the engraving, our proprietary machining center achieves a production speed and quality rivaling mass-produced products. With RE Dot, Ray's Engineering Drawing Object Technology, a bubble jet spray system is used to apply a second coating of solvent onto the wheel design face as an accent color after the first color has been applied. Employing application devices with coating supply heads that make possible the application of colors and decorative designs, Ray's AMT and RE Dot are leading edge technologies that achieve mechanical designs never before possible to reach new heights in wheel design. As you've seen, most forged wheel manufacturing processes are performed by machines. But the final inspection requires human eyes and hands. Inspectors apply all of their considerable knowledge and expertise. As the final inspection is the closest step to the end user, it can only be performed by expert craftsmen with years of experience. Before finished wheels are released onto the market, they undergo a battery of durability tests. Here, the rim disc's strength and its ability to hold the tire's air after a hard impact are assessed. In the JWL standard impact test, a weight of 500 to 600 kilograms is dropped from a height of 230 millimeters to assess impact resistance. But that's not enough for Ray's engineering. The plus R standard from a height of 305 millimeters is used to assess the impact force exerted on the wheel, such as when driving over a curbstone or a speed bump. 
Die forging gives Ray's wheels the resilience to withstand such impacts and is verified in simulations from the design stage. Wheel durability is assessed using drum endurance tests. The JWL standard requires 500,000 rotations, but Ray's engineering has set its own plus R standard of 1 million rotations to ensure that wheels can withstand vertical loads exerted by continuous driving in severe conditions. Ray's wheels can meet this high standard because the forged material has a high fatigue strength and the wheel's composition is uniform, so the strength is also uniform. Certification stickers are applied to wheels that satisfy the plus R standard. These stickers are proof of having passed the most rigorous testing. So these are really uh, impressive processes. And the point of this is not to advertise for one particular company or another. The point is to bring together a bunch of the concepts that we've been talking about from the fatigue to creep to the manufacturing processes and how all of those together form the necessary uh, behaviors of the end material to meet the spec uh, that designers for parts, products, etc., are trying to be able to meet in real meaningful applications. So there can be many different varieties of, uh, there can be many different levels of success uh, in terms of how well a material is going to do. Uh, but this is an example of a company that, that takes their process very, very seriously, as well as their certification, uh, whereas um, Chinese knockoff whatevers from uh, disreputable sites are not going to have the same kind of quality. Um, so the price disparity, there's a reason for it. Um, these are these are a good example of pulling together a lot of these different processes at the same time. So they're doing uh, different degrees of uh, heat treatment throughout this process. They're forging um, in multiple stages in order to get grains that are extremely strong in the directions of loading. And that's why they're hot stamping these, hot forging these in the directions that they are in order to get all of those lines of compressed grains in order to get the uh, in order to get the geometry they're looking for. Um, so I think that was, yeah, that was detailed somewhere about here in the middle. Um, they, they cover, yeah, here it is. Um, so they're covering all of these, uh, different geometries, but the goal of all of them is to get to, uh, a state where all of these compressed grain lines actually form in such a way that they they act like small arches uh, between these support points so that the wheels that they create are exceptionally lightweight but also stronger than a much much heavier cast wheel that could be at twice the overall mass um, and be considerably weaker and prone to breakage um, especially if it made a sudden impact uh, with a curb or somebody uh, hits you in a T-bone or something of that nature, um, some sort of off design axis loading, a cast wheel is going to tend to fracture uh, in that circumstance. And there's plenty of examples of damaged cars with those uh, kinds of damages. Um, but they're doing testing, at least in some regards, some of the ones that they showed here. They're doing the impact testing to show what that looks like. And these wheels are much more resilient uh, to that kind of um, off-axis impact because they're very, very strong. And so they also use a drawing technique with these dies uh, in order to get to the end uh, profile that they want for the wheel. So they start out with this round pancake and end up with something very, very nice at the end um, because of 
each of those steps being carefully engineered, even down to the tooling and machining that they're using being carefully uh, designed so that the manufacturing process, beginning, middle, and end, cooperate to create one uh, overall highly functional material. So this at least gives you some sort of a sense of what it's like to continue working on a material development process for a product uh, that's going to go into a harsh environment. Uh, and that's just a good sort of end-to-end -end example of manufacturing for something like that. So we have an example here that I think will be very helpful and demonstrate very clearly in a way that's simple to understand. This is a little bit hard and difficult to watch, but gives you a very clear sense of what the materials behave like. My mobile IQ here, and I'm going to show you why a forged piston is better than a cast piston in a race car environment. Now this hammer is going to represent the force created by detonation. First, let's see what happens to the cast piston. land broke no more compression engine's not going to run now the same blow to a forge piston look at that piston's still good rings are still free everything still works so this will still be running this just blew up so a very clear very simple easy to understand example um, there's one more that I want to see if I can find to kind of, kind of draw together all of the different principles that we've been talking about um, because the toughness, the propagation of defects, crack propagation in these materials as failure begins, fatigue, all of those things, the material is going to respond differently depending on what its composition is and then exactly how it has been uh, how it has been processed. So what what operations have been done? So uh, forging is very commonly a way to make something as strong as it can reasonably be for a given geometry. Um, but the expense and process and the development based on what you saw for the wheels comparison, you think about the cost between what it takes to make a cast iron pan for lodge versus what it takes for them to make one of those wheels. There's a reason why one of those could be $1,000 a piece where you could buy, um, if you had a decent sale, you could probably buy 200 uh, of those lodge pans for the same $1,000. So there's a big disparity in terms of cost, and this is part of the reason why not everything is always made forged. But it gives you a pretty clear uh, mental image of the actual behavior of the materials in an application. So I wanted to see if I can find one other example for you real quick as we wrap up today. Well, perhaps a little on the crass side, uh, this is actually a reasonably effective demonstration of the quality of materials and why the exact uh, knowing where your materials have come from and what processes have been done on them, why this is all important for the end performance of the system. One race wheel and this is a cheap knockoff and we're gonna ram them into that curb. See, the fact of the matter is a lot of car enthusiasts, Nolan included, buy cheap knockoff parts to save a few bucks. But can cheaping out actually cost you your life like a lot of people online say? Today we're gonna find out. I'm James, he's Zach, welcome to Donut. Hit it, Jerry! <laughs> Thank you to Keeps for sponsoring today's video. Ah, the beautiful planet Earth is under attack. They're bombing too fast. But I thought we eliminated hair loss on Earth, Captain. How could something like this... The first thing we're going to be testing today is race seats. Here we have a Brid Vios 3, which originally retailed for $1,000. And like with any high-end car brand, you're going to have some copycats out there. Like this $400...
quality version possible. This is a real Anki RPF1. And this is an ESR SR11. Huh, it looks kind of similar. It's surprisingly, they look pretty similar. What's up with that? This wheel uh, in this spec retails for $450 each. This one, about half the price at $250. This S14. I forgot that you had this. Yeah, well, it doesn't run. Uh, well, I know the perfect way to get it running, or at least motivate us to get it running. Mm. Let's add some arrow. Ah, <laughs> yes. Let's. This is a real Rocket Bunny spoiler for an S14 that we got off our friends at Gretty and we paid $320. And this is its counterfeit counterpart that we got online for $97. Right off the bat, this one's black, this one's white. <laughs> this one's white. This one feels nice. It's got a little flex to it. It's pretty thin. Yeah, uh, you have a nice sticker with Japanese words. So this is going to be actually a very practically useful example of differences in the behavior of composites because we've talked about them, but you haven't seen them in destructive testing in the same way because there's just not nearly as much of that kind of material. I would pull more examples of things like biomedical applications, for instance, but uh, unfortunately that doesn't really work because people don't do this sort of uh, hands-on destructive testing with those sorts of things, usually because people are attached to them. So uh, this will suit our purposes today. On that's it. true. That's how you know it's a real part. This one has a number 17 written in Sharpie. <laughs> now both of these claim to be made out of FRP. The real Rocket Bunny has like a nice like kind of lip here. Yeah. Like, and this doesn't. Yeah, that looks nasty. This looks like a bad like mold. Yeah. And this looks like it was made by somebody who cared about it, you know? Yeah. We know the guy. His name is Nero. Yeah. We made an entire video about Nero. We'll put a link in the description, but all of these parts are made by crazy digital computer scans. And this is probably based on this. Yeah, it seems to definitely be based on it. All right, James, to test the strength and durability of our spoilers, why don't you push on them, try to get them to flex, see how they handle it. I can't get enough force. Huh, well, what should we do? Well, if only we had a friend who was really good at nunchucks. Whoa! Holy crap! All right, three, two, one, hit it! Oh. <laughs> All right, so one hit in, it took off the uh, outer layer. Yeah, but it's still in one piece. Mm -hmm. I'm bummed because I really wanted you to have this for your <laughs> car. I thought that was sort of like the silver lining to this video, but yeah. I guess not. Let's see how the cheap spoiler compares. Okay, Coach Dofferson, are you ready? Yes, sir. Three, two, one, hit it. All right, so after one thwack, it's definitely cracked more. It is definitely cracked from that thwack, and that's On way deeper into the fiberglass. That's like dug way in, and it split it this way. And when you look at that, at the very end of the spoiler, it started to split in half along that uh, line as well. So, not very good. So the counterfeit piece uh, broke way harder, quicker. Yeah. I'd say it's pretty obvious the legitimate part is a lot better quality. Obviously, this isn't the most scientific way to test spoilers, but to us, buying authentic parts means supporting people who designed them, and you know you're getting the highest quality version possible. This is a real Anki RPF-1. And this is an ESR SR11. Huh, it looks kind of similar. Surprisingly, they look pretty similar. What's up with that? This wheel uh, in this spec retails for $450 each. This one, about half the price at $250. This uses a process that Anki refers to as MAT, or Most Advanced Technology. Technology, and all that means is that this is a rotary forged wheel. And what that means is that this wheel is made, uh, the face is cast, they, they gravity cast the whole wheel, and then they put it onto a rotary forged drum, and they draw out the barrel. And what that does is squishes the metal, makes the grain structure a lot tighter, so you get the characteristics of a forged wheel in a cast wheel. It's pretty cheap, but very strong. ESR doesn't provide any information on how they make these wheels. Uh, and I think once we crack these things open, we're gonna be able to tell a huge difference in the quality of the material. Yeah, I think these should be much stronger. This is just a cast wheel, where this is a cast wheel that's been rotary forged. So if that rotary forging does anything, this should be a stronger wheel. And now last time we tested real versus fake wheels, we dropped a wheel off the roof. This time we're gonna drop an anvil off the roof onto the wheels like a couple of wily e. Coyotes. Yeah, we're switching it up. Yeah. <laughs> then we're gonna take a little microscopic look at the inside of these things to see the differences in the metallurgy of both wheels. First, the real Enki RPF1s. Three, <laughs> two, one. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so this thing is dented, dented. for sure. You now, can limp home on this for definite. Absolutely, it's gonna have a little bit of a vibration, but you're still in one piece and you're still alive. Now let's see how that ESR SR11 does. Today's sponsor, Nissan, invited us to Nashville to check out the all new Nissan Kicks. The newly designed Kicks has a Bose Personal Plus system with 10 speakers throughout the car. If you're looking for a spacious concert on wheels, check out the all new Nissan Kicks. Three, two, one. 
Boy, you hit it square on the front face bead and it broke. Dude, this thing is cracked, bro. That's a that's not a barrel hit really, but uh, it hit the lip and literally ripped it off the face, which is pretty crazy. Uh, I mean, this is pretty this is pretty obvious, but we're gonna try it again. Hit the barrel directly because we're scientists and we want some like really good data. Ooh. This thing can't dent to save its life. We ripped right through the barrel. Got a nice dent, hole. All right, so we have some cross sections from each wheel here. Uh, the fake one, we have a much larger cross section. For some reason. Okay, that's a pretty good focus there. What do you see? Metal. Yeah, it looks like something you'd find under the ground. Yeah, it looks like a rock. Yeah. I mean, it looks it looks pretty uniform. I don't see any big chunks. It just looks like tiny speckles of metal all squished together. Which I guess is what you want in a wheel. I think so. Now let's look at the knockoff wheel and see if we can see any difference. Yeah, so right off the bat, the fake wheel has a lot more inconsistencies than the real wheel. Yeah, it looks like gravel. Big old chunks of crap in it. And basically what that means is the metal is just less dense. It's less squished together and uh, you, get, you get some porosity, uh, which means that there's places there isn't metal, which is not what you want in a wheel. All right, James, well, it's very interesting, I think, that we've got a huge piece of the fake wheel and just a tiny piece of the real wheel. How did that happen? Well, it happened during our final test uh, featuring the new donut mobile laboratory. Roll that footage. <laughs> so we've all seen videos of guys doing bad donuts into a curb and breaking their wheels, especially in those takeovers, which you shouldn't do. But what we want to see today is if we can break a wheel by hitting it laterally, by hitting it sideways. So we've mounted them up on the front of our Previa. And we're gonna run straight into a curb, see what happens. <laughs> Oh my God! That's not what I expected. <laughs> well, the okay. Knockoff shattered. It's true. So the test rig didn't work exactly how we intended it to, but it still ended up doing its job. The real wheel uh, is in mostly one messed piece. up, but mostly in one piece. The fake one shattered. Yeah, exactly dude. what I predicted. Ripped it off. But it worked out great. Yeah. Oh my God! Took a big chunk out, but you know what? Didn't do that. Well, yeah. Henry, I don't know about your welding skills, but the test worked out in spite of it. Fake wheels, potentially killers. If you run over a curb going 100 miles <laughs> sideways. Thank you guys for watching this video. So again, uh, you won't see that kind of direct materials testing uh, elsewhere, but that gives you a pretty clear idea of the macroscopic uh, implications of the microstructure and the purity of the metal. So degrees of impurities and as much non-scientists as they are, uh, they rightly hit on the key components of this lesson that the uniform fine grains of the forged wheel make the material almost infinitely stronger, multiple times stronger than the uneven large grains cast uh, in the other wheel that is a knockoff. So uh, very important to have the correct operations and procedures uh, and to know the history of the metal that you're working with for the design or make sure you understand what the processes are uh, so that you can tightly control the end result um, because when you have failures of that type uh, that's when people actually get hurt um, and it's all fun and games until that point so uh, this will do it for us for today um, we're going to be getting into uh, chapter 17 and then we're going to be coming up on uh, taking exam three, which will include the principles from 9, 10, 11. Um, we'll be taking that uh, on uh, the week of Thanksgiving um, so that we can get exam three in the books. So we have a lot of, a lot of stuff coming up, um, but we need to now start getting into 17 a little bit uh, and see how far we can get there. So we'll see you in the next one.